who knows? Who knows? But anyway, so uh, in review, so uh, I wanted to mention this wonderful thing that happened with us is um, we, we found a way to deal with, um, with microbes. We have come up with a um, tool that, you know, I have it right here. It comes in a bottle like this. I mean, we can show it. Uh, it's called Amazing Soak. It's actually a, it's sort of like a uh, antimicrobial agent and you can okay. use it as a sanitizer. And uh, that's- Oh, so if I wanted to like clean my kitchen's yeah. Uh, yeah. counter, I can- Yeah, and there. so we sell it either as a concentrate in a bottle like this, or we can dilute it 50 to one and we put it in a bottle like this. And when it's diluted like that, you can see that this, this has got a spray top. So, and, and I, I personally use it in a bottle like this. It also has a spray top. And so mm. when I use it, I just go um, open wide and I spray it in my, in my mouth. And so <laughs> I inhale it. However, this is- Did you dilute it in that bottle or? What's, what's that? Did you dilute it in that bottle? Is that- Yeah, so the stuff in the bottle is diluted 50 to one. Yeah, we definitely don't want to inhale the concentrate. Right. I did put some of the concentrate straight in my ear and because I thought, well, let's see if I can deal with this ear problem. And uh, it was not smart. Um, oh, was that painful? It was unpleasant. <laughs> so I shiver just thinking about that. So what I, the reason I'm putting this up here is this. I'm really disappointed in how our world is not allowing intelligent technologies to be discussed on the public channels. Like when, right. when Trump started talking about, well, maybe there's some kind of a bleach that we could use to uh, maybe like get these things under control. I don't know if he knew it or didn't know it, but this is what he was talking about. It exists. Mm -hmm. And of course he was made fun of mercilessly. Right. Um, and so we're not talking about this stuff, probably because it doesn't suit the agenda of the people who are in control of the pharmaceutical industry. But there are others. Um, for example, uh, Dr. Brownstein, has been broadcasting about using hydrogen peroxide and iodine in an right. analyzer. Oh, okay. Right. Works phenomenal. It, it works. Uh, another guy was talking about using colloidal silver. That also works. Like you can spray colloidal silver on things. I read some, some people are using a lot of vitamin D3, and making sure they've got their vitamin D up and get a lot of sun. And Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> that's the other thing. Yeah, vitamin D works. That needs to be, you need to have your vitamin D level above uh, 50, pre preferably above 60. Most uh, Americans are below 40 and black Americans are below 20. One of the main reasons that dark skinned people are doing badly with these infections is the vitamin D issue. Right. You need to have all your levels at optimum levels as yeah. opposed to in survival mode. Yeah, well, above survival, thrival. Right. Right. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean if you're at if you're at a survival mode, then anything can push you off the deep end and you're gonna oh, yeah. have if, more problems. If you're barely hanging on. Like for example, one of the major outbreaks in Sweden, one was in old folks' homes. And the other one was in the Somalians, Somali. Oh, regions. okay. From what Africa. happens when you take Africans uh, up to, I don't know what, 57 or 80, 60 degrees north? Yeah, they don't get any sun. No. Even when it's sunny, they don't get any sun. No, they're, they're just not equipped. Anyway, so that that was the there was the two major outbreaks, right? And right. and again, this this is discussed in the alternative channels, but not on the mainstream, right? It's even discussed in the medical journals, but it's ignored there too. It's well, no, it's in the journals. It's studied. 
That's what I mean. It's studied, but it's ignored. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the mainstream media is ignoring putting it. it out, and and the doctors in the hospitals are not using it. Why? Well, they don't read the journals, probably. Yeah. Another thing is zinc, and hydroxychloroquine. Yet another thing that <laughs> the <laughs> poor Trump. Yeah. He got blasted okay. on that one a lot. Well, he did. And yet, okay, and yet, if you use, if you increase zinc, you are strengthening the um, immune response. Like the immune system is healthier. In fact, people who are experiencing slow healing of wounds or slow recovery from almost anything are usually low in zinc. Mm. And the hydroxychloroquine, its performance depends on there being adequate zinc. So whoever was testing it, you know, like if, again, here goes again, the blindness of the system, they will test the hydroxychloroquine and saying, well, it doesn't work. Well, it's supposed to work when you supplement the zinc with it. Like it's, it's like a vehicle for the zinc, right? Yeah, if you don't have the zinc, then it's not gonna work. Yeah, it's like saying this, uh, car won't drive well you only have three wheels on right yeah or you don't have any gas in the tank or or no gas yeah something like that huh yeah so so that's that's uh, that has been the biggest uh, thing in our um, business as such is that uh, we continue to have this intellectual struggle with the mainstream that, that actively just ignores the, the alternative message. And yet right. the alternative works. It works, it works, it's safe. But I'm not allowed to, to tell you that it's okay for you to use your uh, kitchen counter sanitizer and inhale it. Right. So I'm not telling you that, please, please note, um, legal disclaimer. Just because it worked for me doesn't mean it's going to work for you. Right. I have not given you a medical advice. I just told you what worked for me. So did you ever get uh, the COVID? I, I had something weird that uh, made me quite unwell. I don't know. I caught it on 29th of February, 28th of February. Okay. And by March 6th, I was... I had fever and uh, whatever, and then I was over it. I was uh, I was quite ill in the beginning of January, but it, none of the, you know, it was basically a bad cold. It none of the, you know, when they say you've got dry cough or whatever. You might just have had an inter- uh, ordinary winter. That's what I think it was. It was, I think it was, a, had a very sore throat, lots of phlegm, and uh, it just, and Usually, like I would think after 64 years, I kind of understand, you know, my, the process of a cold, a normal cold. And it just went, you know, it goes to one place and then it goes to another place and then it goes to another place, and goes to another place and another place until it's done. Right. Yep. And you, I could feel that. It was like, I can breathe through my nose today, cough, cough. And then tomorrow, uh, my nose plugged up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> And it just did the rounds and then it was gone. It was like a few weeks, but, uh, uh, and what I, what I really enjoyed doing was going and uh, having a sauna because I was actually was back here and uh, I would go to the pool and go in the sauna. Yeah. And heat shock therapy is really good for the immune system. The best use of the sauna is if you also have a cold pool with it. Yeah, you, you really want to heat yourself up, overheat yourself and then cool yourself. Right. Like, you know, get out of the sauna, roll in the snow or jump in the lake and then come out. I spent six weeks with Norwegians and they were doing that sort of stuff. And it just drove me absolutely crazy. It's like, oh, I can't even look. You're <laughs> jumping in this ice cold water and I'm like, oh. You know, when you're really overheated, it actually feels like a pleasant uh, experience. I guess, I guess, but. Yeah, I wasn't overheat. I was not overheated enough. Oh yeah. Although you know, I need to tell you a little story about overheating now, just to go on a segue in in no man's land. 
for a year and a half, I did um, sweats, the native sweats mm-hmm. in North Vancouver. Every Monday afternoon, we would go. And it was kind of interesting because this guy I knew was going and his girlfriend was going. She was not native. And she knew me and she said, would you come with, you know, and support me and go? And she knew I would probably like to do this anyway. And that's how I ended up going. And we really affected the people that were there because, they, you know, there was all like Native Americans and they all had bad opinions of white folk. And then here was these two and they were, we weren't, we were never the ones, you know, all my brothers let me out of here. It's too hot. And we just put up with it and put up with it and put up with it. And, uh, and she told me later, you know, we really affected their attitudes towards, you know, white folk, which was kind of nice. But unfortunately, her boyfriend's son, around 22, committed suicide. So, yeah, he was in Calgary. And so they decided that they would have a, well, I don't know, who, they were going to have a sweat, not in, I don't know about in honor of, but to heal. It was a healing sweat. And it was this big thing that they, you know, this tragedy. So that she called me and said, we were doing this thing. We'd really like you to come. And I said, okay, I'll come. So I've been doing a sweat for over a year every week now. And I go to this thing. And I realized that <clears throat> all the sweats I was going to, as hard as they might have been, was kindergarten. This sweat was serious. <laughs> It's like, you know, it's kind of like we go paddle in the lake, everything. That's what the sweats were. I didn't know, right? And then when we had this this particular sweat, it was like, no, we're like really getting serious. Okay. And I got home. It was like, it would have been like an hour after it was done. I'd pulled my shirt off and I had lines burnt into my skin from the sweat dripping down. Oh, boy. Like, yeah, I mean, it was like you were you were cooking yourself with your water. Yeah, like it was. It, oh. it wasn't like second degree burns or anything like that. But I was, you, I could see all of these lines, red lines, where water had obviously just dripped down, right? Okay. And it was so intense. All right. Yeah. But apparently, you were strong enough to do it. Yeah, well, I mean, I, and the thing is, is that I wasn't there thinking of me. I wasn't thinking of my pain. I was thinking of healing my friend's pain. Okay. And uh, yeah, it was, but I mean, that was like no BS. That's quite, Very good. That was like hot. And uh, so anyway, you just reminded me of that experience. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, so I think so often we do stuff and we're just kind of like, da di da di da And then how often do we actually like really have to get serious and and focus and it was only a couple hours but it makes it makes a huge difference okay so let's just switch it up a bit we talked about all the horrible things um let me ask you like so travel in the age of corona how how is it uh, there isn't any <laughs> well how did you manage to travel even though nobody else is uh I guess well, you're willing to quarantine. That's one thing, right? I, yeah, I I got to Medellin, Colombia three days before they closed the border. And I was going to be leaving to go to Ecuador. And I had a place in Ecuador that I would have stayed for a couple months. Um, didn't happen? It didn't happen. What's that? It did not happen. It did not happen because I couldn't leave. And I would have probably been there a lot longer because she she was going to Boston. She was taking her husband who was ill back to the States. And I don't know that she could have got back, but um, what happened with me was the hotel I was in closed down and they said, well, we've got another hotel. We'll put you up there. And we did that. And I could see that like, this was getting serious. Like, I mean, I don't know the language that well. I'm not hundred percent sure what's going on. It's just like things seem to be closing down. I was a bit worried about how I was going to get food, but as long as you're in a hotel, like they usually feed you. So um, in this hotel, I, I looked at Airbnb and I found a place because here I'm in this hotel and all I have is one little window. And I'm thinking, you know, I don't know how long this is going to last, but I don't really want to be in a hotel room for any length of time. If I don't have to be. So 
this Airbnb was on the ninth floor of an eighth floor building. In other words, they had built on top of the building a little studio and there was a big terrace. So, uh, and it was a 10 minute walk from where I was and, but nobody was supposed to be out. So I was like, actually when I left, I was kind of a little scared because I've got my suitcase and I'm going down the road trying to find this, this Airbnb. And uh, I got in and then the, uh, I said to the owner, I said, you know, this about a, two months in, I, because it then become obvious I was going to be there a long time. I said, you know, what would be really nice here is a hammock. He goes, oh, that'd be great. Well, I have no clue how to get a hammock. And I have certainly no clue how to get a hammock during a quarantine lockdown. But I said to him, if you buy, if you find it, I'll pay for it. And so he was like, oh, okay. And about two weeks later, I had a hammock, which was great. Because then I could just lay out, medicine weather is perfect all the time. And clouds come up onto the mountains and there's always lightning, like, like five nights out of seven, there's these lightning blasts going on. And so there's this great show. And I just, so I was in a really good environment. The only problem I had was there was a place I could go get food, a little grocery store, but really what was I going to do for eating? And that's when I discovered takeout, <laughs> like all of these places that were closing because, you know, they would, they start posting on the Facebook group. Hey, if you want this, you know, these are the meals I make. If you want, we deliver because delivery was going on. And so, so every couple easily translated because you can translate using the digital tools, right? Well, plus it was a Facebook group for expats. So they knew to post in English for us. Oh, so that there was actually a whole bunch of people in Medellin that are expats yeah. that are helping one another. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and they would, they would be looking at the news and they'd be posting the news and they'd be translating the news and summarizing the news and that sort of stuff. Yeah. Okay. And uh, then we weren't allowed to leave. Like we could leave one day a week, I think at one point, well, I think at one point we couldn't leave at all. And then it was, you can go out for an hour at two o'clock in the afternoon for. An, so an the hour. cities are just empty and deserted. It's well, they look deserted. They're full of people who yeah. can't get out, right? And I have to say, I loved it because there were no planes roaring across the sky. There was no traffic. There was no fire alarms. There was, you know, no yelling and screaming. There was no loud music. It was, it was great. The, the, the uh, air improved and the quality of the air was right. not good. And then it was great. And yeah. You know, so, do you, so do you think that they are going broke doing this? Uh, well, I, there's no doubt that a lot of businesses went under because they couldn't afford to pay the rent. And right. a lot of restaurants had a really tough time. And I think a lot, and a lot of people had a really tough time. Like Medellin has no social uh, net for people who, who run into problems. They talked about, you know, like in Canada, here's $2,000, be quiet or whatever, um, you know, buy some food. In Colombia, there was nothing... They talked about it, but then there was never any money, right? Like oh, we've got the X amount of money, and, and the X amount of money went into the somebody mayor's stole. pocket. <laughs> Not, somebody stole it. Yeah, yeah, somebody stole it. So, uh, so when the borders opened, well, they, basically they allow started allowing traffic, you know, people out of the city, people into different parts of the country, and so I went to Santa Marta, which is on the Caribbean coast, for two weeks. I really wanted to sit by a beach, to be honest. Yeah. And, uh, and that was wonderful. And then it was like, you could have left if you wanted to take a humanitarian flight, which is like two grand or something. And I thought, if I have to be stuck somewhere, I'm where I would be happy being stuck. So, you know, I think one lesson for people is if you've gone through this last nine months and you're really unhappy about it and you're unhappy about your life and you're unhappy about where you live, you should start thinking about how you can change those things because I wasn't living in my home and I was, you know, it's like, I feel, I feel like ashamed to say I was happy. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, I, you know, I, you don't get exercise. No, I'm on the ninth floor. So what I would do when they delivered me my lunch is I would, I would take the elevator down nine floors and then I would walk with my lunch up nine floors and I would right. do that once or twice or three times a day and that was you know i was huffing and puffing and it wasn't well, you know then nine floors that's a reasonable lift yeah and it was amazing to me after two months 
how much stronger my legs are because I could tell I was going up faster, right? Yes. I was taking two steps instead of one step and all the rest of it. So it's fun when you do those things and you see a, an improvement. Yeah. And, that's great. you know, my business is such that I don't have an office. I can do it anywhere I have my computer. Yeah, this is an interesting thing. I wanted to ask you is, of course, like you're you're out there and you're not suffering because you're portable, right? Like you managed, yeah. well, I mean, you were, you were virtual before it became a necessity, right? Right. And so, I, th it, I thrived. So what, what did you thrive with? Well, my business thrived is what, what yeah, I meant. But, well, did you, did you, I mean, I remember you, you were a podcaster back when. Right. Right, like your your main your main job, as I remember it, uh, at the at the time when we decided that we we're not going to do this every day or every week, was that you would uh, coach people to create courses and put them online and and manage that. Right? Did yeah. you stay with that? Yeah, I I have over 140 courses on Udemy now, and uh, I they don't make a lot of money. They, they make a, they make a lot of money if you live in Colombia or Africa, but uh, they don't really make a lot of money. However, the credibility and the positioning uh, caused my business to grow like crazy. So people wanted. So it's a social proof tool for you, right? Yeah, yeah. And people watch what you do, right? Like people have been watching me for years and years and years. I never knew until. You know, they started asking, you know, so they started approaching me, asking me questions and saying, yeah, I've been watching what you've been doing for the last, you know, really? And uh, one friend of mine had been watching for a while and her client needed some help. And then she said, well, Scott can help you. Introduced me. He loved what I did. He introduced me to some of his friends. He's part of a high-end mastermind. He, I made the presentation for him to present about what we were doing. He says, I don't know what you're doing, Scott, but can you do a presentation about it for me? And he gave that presentation and three or four people came. And, and instead of having one client, I have, you know, six or seven. And I don't need a lot of clients. And um, so these, happy. these clients pay you a monthly fee or something? Yeah, or? yeah every month they pay me a, a monthly. I send them an invoice. They pay the invoice. And I pay my, uh, my remote staff and we get all the work done for them. Yeah, we'll talk about remote staff. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Well, what happened with, with that is I was working too hard and he had a, a virtual assistant who was supposed to be paid for 40 hours. He paid for 40 hours, but she wasn't working 40 hours and she was honest. So she had said, you know, I, I, I need more work. And he said, well, I don't know what work you should do. So she turns to me and says, Scott, can we give her some work? So I did. Oh, so this is like I have prepaid 20 hours of work that's not being used. Could you make use of it, please? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Because <laughs> they have a contract and it's the contract and you don't fill You don't give them enough work. That's not their problem. You don't know. Of course. No, I, I don't know how. They she hated being that. idle. Yeah. Yeah. She hated being idle. And she also did not like her company. She loved her my client, but she didn't like her company. And the company paid her a thousand and charged him 2200 okay. and if i know i guess if you're the rolls roy i mean we all know about cars there are 500 dollars cars and there's 500 thousand dollar cars and there's a big difference but it struck me that she wasn't uh, being treated very well and he wasn't receiving value and of course that's totally subjective yeah you can compress that right like you can give her a raise and give him a pay cut and be in and that's what i did i said well if you're unhappy let me talk to the client i talked to the client i said listen i can save you 500 700 bucks a month and she's going to make an extra 500 dollars a month and i'll manage it if you're okay with that so okay. she's he said great you know i'm of course happy to save 700 bucks and um uh, so then she started looking at what I was, she could see what I was doing, right? And she said, you know, you're working way too hard. And I go, yeah, I know, but you know, what can you do? And she says, well, I know some people that can help you and do this work for you. Because a lot of the work I do is, in this, it's all repetitive, like, you know, so it's other people could do it easily. And so she found these two amazing young men and we had a meeting and then they did some work. And then each week we were having this meeting and she's running the meeting. And I realized she's actually running my company. So maybe <laughs> I should have a more formal relationship and compensate her. And so now she's, I don't know, 
So I basically her, her raise, like, yes. Yeah, she doubled her money. And well, and what happened at the same time, and I think, you know, this is why I say that this whole COVID thing has been a blessing for me, was she, I'm from Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, and she was working for a, a number of dentists in an office in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. And because of COVID, nobody was going to the office. So they said, I'm sorry, you know, we can't use you. Goodbye. So she had lost this client and lost this income. And then I come along and replace it and better. So, oh, so, she, so the original 20 hours became full time. Well, she was working full time for him. And then she's working full time for me because yes. she's in the Philippines and she wants to, she's young and she wants to work as much as she can to be able to buy a house. So All right. the good news is, is that they just put a down payment on a lot out in the countryside and they're going to be building a house there. And she, she sent me a picture and she says, you see this, this building here? And I go, yeah. She says, well, that's yours. <laughs> When you're old and gray, I said, you know, I am already, uh, <laughs> you can, you can, you're going to come here and we're going to look after you. So, <laughs> well, that's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. 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 So okay. now we have about 18, 17, 18 people. We, I call them remote staff. I don't call them virtual assistants. And because the other thing that happened was, so she's helping me do my, my business. And what that meant was the things that I had no time to do, I could start doing. So it's, so I'm giving more and better service to our clients. Right. And, and also I told them, you know, we're not a, remote staff company we're not a podcast producing company we're we are a problem solving company so as you're talking to our clients and they talk to you about a problem let me know let us see if we can solve that problem we want to solve all of their problems if we can right and if it falls into the realm of what we can do so one of my clients said you know we're just banged for time we just i can't get everything organized and blah 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 and we have uh loans that we process and we don't have enough time to do that so i told i told trixie i said let's you know can you do that can you find someone to do this she says sure and of course the other thing that happened again this is a blessing from covid was uh, the chinese and the americans laid off all their filipino workers so people that had been working 10 15 years in a job had no work So when Trixie comes along and says, hey, you've been an executive assistant for 20 years, 10 years, say, uh, we have an executive pos exec position here, would you like to? And, then, and of course, they're not like rookies. They've been, they've been do, they know what to do. The client has no clue, but they just tell the client, no worries. I'll give me this, give so me this, give me this. These are trained people with deep experience. They, so you, you have the pick of the talent pool. Yeah, and they're all excited. And what I talk about all the time is being treated with respect. Yes. I treat them all with respect. Everybody in the organization knows we treat everybody with respect. The only people that we take on our clients are people that we know are very respectful because it's very, because in my experience, the Filipinos are, have huge hearts, but they're very much taken advantage of in a lot of places yeah and i you know one of my best friends is married to one and he's known her for i don't know how many decades and so i've known the whole relationship and when she's they started out she was a nanny and the family that she was a nanny at treated her like dirt yeah. and he's so mad and i remember that and so we so we treat everybody well we create this good environment for them and our clients just love them and what do they do they tell their friends And then their friends are like, it's like every week we have two or three requests for an executive assistant. And oftentimes it's, um, I know I need the help, but I just don't know what to do. Or I tried it before and it never worked. Well, that's yeah. because you didn't have a good. And so we do a really, we try to do a really good job of, well, we do do a really good job of matching them up with the right types of personalities and the right quality of people. And it's not just executive assistants, loan processors, outbound callers, that sort of stuff. And it's just, and we're amazed. Like she and I, we just talk to each other and we go, can you believe we're like 18 people? No. Uh -huh. And so, and so this is thanks to there being decent connection, like the, the broadband is available, the people are able to do the work, they, 
And how does it work for time zone switch? I mean, they are multi. A lot of times they stay up all night. They, they just work at night, yeah? Well, we, and that's the other thing is I say, look, I want to try to get, you, get it so that you're not up all night. But sometimes that's not the case. So we'll talk to the other thing that's nice about an executive assistant in a place like the Philippines is there could be a lot of work that you give them to do at five o'clock at night. You go home, watch TV, go to sleep, wake up in the morning and it's all done. So right. try to get them to work. Okay. Two or three hours, start two or three hours before the client starts. So they get everything organized and up to dates and then the client hits okay. there and they say, okay, I got to do this, 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 and then they're done. And, uh, and then they may show up later on in the day or. Yeah. You know, yeah. Like they could finish at 10 in the morning, like five till 10 in the morning. And then they could end up working, you know, like nine to 12 in the evening, except that's nine in the morning till noon in the Philippines. Right. So a little, so you'd be working a little bit in the evenings because it's the opposite, right? The morning yeah. here is the evening there. So they'll work for a while in the, in the morning and then they have two or three hours interaction with the client. And then it just sort of depends. Like one of the things that uh, we get them to do for our, one of the problems a lot of clients have is managing their inbox. Okay. Yep. So they have like three types of emails, right? They have the spam email that takes them to Amazon and that wastes two hours of their day. Then yep. they have the moderately important emails that if they answered tomorrow, it would be okay. And then they have the emergency ones that they got to know right away. And this was our first client was, uh, was had this problem, right? So once he kind of trained her as to which were which, then she would text him when there was an emergency email, right? Like the high priority email had to be deal dealt with right away. She would just go, hey, George, there's a, you know, here's this, this is the email, blah, blah, blah. I better check it right away, right? And then he'd look and he'd say, actually, that wasn't that important. This is why it wasn't or whatever. Or yeah, that great, thanks. So that they, they fine tune it. And he's like 10 times more productive because he doesn't go off to Amazon and 13 other sites for yeah. three hours in the middle of the day. <laughs> Only interrupted by a real need for interrupts. Yeah. Right. Okay. And then what she does is she takes all the medium, not, you know, sort of has to be answered emails. And I believe what she does is this is what I told her to do, but I don't, I don't check it. So I don't know if someone else checks it is uh, she makes one email and she says, oh, these are all the questions. And then he answers all the questions, sends it back, and then she pops it into the emails that are supposed to go wow. and sends it all off, right? So he spends, you know, maybe an hour a day on email instead of three hours a day on email and four hours a day on spam sites that he shouldn't have gone to. So it sounds, all good. So, yeah. so it sounds to me like you have managed to um, honor your, your good heart, your wish to help people, right? Yeah. And, uh, well, I have a I have a program that I call 500 for 500 plus one. And it came from when I was traveling and I was invited to Tunisia to talk to some entrepreneurs, some young entrepreneurs, 30 somethings. And then I was in <clears throat> Mombasa, Kenya, and I was by this um, highway and I was impressed with the Tunisians, how smart they were and how sharp they were and how hardworking they were and how poor the system was there. You just kept them down. There was all these different problems in terms of having, trying to make any sort of, you know, small business for yourself and that sort of thing. And then when I was in Mombasa, I, it's like noon, it's 105 degrees, the sun is beating down. And I see this guy walking down the highway, pulling a cart full of wood. And I thought I wouldn't for pennies, you know, he's not getting very much money. I said, I would never work that hard. And so my whole preconceived notion of, you know, uh, you know, poor people are lazy, you know, was like thrown out. And I thought, you know what, if I could help, and I asked people in both countries, you know, if you could make $500 US a month, would that make a difference in your life? And they were like, yeah, it would be, it would be, we'd have, we'd have a life, right? It's a massive difference, right? A massive difference. So I thought that's what I wanted to do. And I had a number of false starts and I thought I'd, you know, maybe try and get some people to help me teach them, uh, affiliate marketing, because that seemed to be a good way to do it online. I never thought that I would end up hiring 500 people, and I haven't yet, but I could see in two or three years 
having an organization with 500 people and <clears throat> because we're just, it's just growing organically. Right. And we can see who our ideal clients are and we can see that there's lots of them and they need help. So the whole idea was to help 500 people make $500 a month, improve their local community because the money, you know, spiral, you know, you pay, you pay the grocer, you buy some clothes, you buy, you know, get some things fixed and it, there's that multiplier effect that occurs. And so that's what, what I tell all the clients. Okay. This is why we're doing this. We're not doing this to make money. And the other thing we tell them is what we're paying the staff and how much we're taking. We need to make money because if we don't make money, we're not going to be interested when you call us with a problem. Right? <laughs> and everybody understands that, right? But I'm not doubling the wage of the staff, right? Mm -hmm. I just think that's excessive, right? I mean, if, if you've got 500 staff members and you're making a thousand dollars a month on them and they're only making you know a thousand that's just i just don't see that as being reasonable right well you could because others have done it but yeah. you, you could argue it's possible but i just don't think it's fair right right and, and so i guess what you're doing is you're giving the unfair advantage to the local person your your contract person yeah, we're paying them more than they would get from other. Well, I, I see it the other way is that I can hire a person for less than yes. what I would have to hire it elsewhere. Right. Yeah. I guess, uh, <laughs> in a way, that's not nice because you're exporting jobs from the rich countries to the poor countries, right? Well, the rich countries are getting checks from their governments, and the poor countries, they aren't. Oh, I'm not saying that this is not helping the world. It's just uh, what, what it's doing. It's not, not my job to help. Oh, I know. Germany. I'm just thinking that, you know, I have this person working for me in Canada and uh, they're getting a wage that's probably double of what I can hire a person with you. Right. Well, and I think one of the things that uh, people have to think about wherever they are is what value are they giving, right? Mm. Like, one, for example, a lot of what the, my business is with my clients is I get together with them, we record a video, we turn it into an audio, we turn it into a blog post, we get traffic to it, that sort of thing. And nowhere ever did we ever talk about taking a snippet of text and turning it into an image quote. But we do two per client per week. And uh, we send it off to them and they put it posted on their Facebook or whatever. So it's a picture of them with some wise thing that they said. And, uh, you know, they love that and everything else, but we didn't have to do that. But I just thought, you know what, that's a really good way to, you know, raise it, you know, raise their profile, get stuff onto their social media. That's, it's interesting. That's helpful. That's not always salesy, salesy, salesy. And, um, we're looking now at doing the same thing except making it a video. And these aren't long. I mean, it's not like it takes two hours to make the image quote, right? Yeah. Although from, if you look, it depends on how you look at it, right? Because somebody had to look at the whole thing that the person said and pick it out. And then somebody had to make the image and then somebody has to post it and all the rest of it. But um, it just seemed to me that that would be a good thing to do. So as I find things that are good for my clients, I tell them and we talk about it and then we implement it and we move forward. And I don't charge them any more. So that, you know, cause I want to be at the point where it's like the stupidest idea in the world is to get rid of Scott and his team. Right. So if I'm working for you as a one, one man shop, then I need to, and I'm serious about it, then I need to sit down and say, okay, well, how can I help Martin, you know, more and more and more. And, yeah. uh, Great. And that's, so that's what I would say to your person is like, you know, you need to make sure that you're constantly reinforcing the value because I tell my staff, you know, there's a hundred million people in the Philippines who'd like to have your job. And I don't tell you that to scare you, but to tell you, you know, don't get complacent and I'm not complacent with my clients. Right. And don't be yeah. complacent with yours. So it's all about giving value and being seen to give value and, the people that do, you know, you, you never let them go. And it's interesting because a few of my clients, you know, we have, they've asked me to go to their marketing meetings. And so I meet the people that are on their marketing team and they all say the same thing. It's like, once you start working with us, you never go away. <laughs> like they're, they're people that are working 30 years for them, right. In the, on their marketing team, or they're, a, you know, their number two person has been there for 40 years and, 
and uh, it's pretty astounding, right? Yeah. So, you know, once you find gold people, you keep them. Okay. It's a nice story. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's good. Um, who knows? Maybe my uh, customers will soon be talking to one of your um, employees. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you're overwhelmed and you need help, we're getting there. To Martin and Martin will get, get you a hold of me. We only do referrals, by the way. Like we don't market this or put, shout it out or anything. I don't, I mean, if you hadn't have said, I want to talk about this, I wouldn't have been talking about it. But I trust you a lot and I know your judgment. So if, if someone calls me up and says, hey, Martin told me to call you in, in then I'm happy to talk to you. Great. Because I know you're a good person. Thank you. And yes, I have not, I you, have a, not you a good person, but your friend is a good person. Yeah. I know you're a good person, but I know I that's what person I'm because I have on my website this link that says uh, reviews. And if you click on that, you can see. I mean, this is hosted on a third party, right? Like I don't mm. even control it. Right? Good. It just is a stream of people doing whatever they do. And uh, we get 4.8 out of five long term. Nice. And, and the, the, the stuff that people say make me blush at times, <laughs> right? Uh, you and Maureen go above and beyond. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, that, that's one thing that saved us. You know, when uh, Google did this uh, deplatforming of uh, all alternative nutritional kind of stuff, right? They, they really cut, you know, our traffic went down from 2,000 a day to 300 a day. Wow, that's, that's what that's. I don't know what the number is. A seventh. And uh, anyway, if it were not for the mailing list we had, and for the stellar, uh, I guess I could call it reputation with our customers, yeah, we we would have been out of business. Yeah. Yeah. Same, same beauty on Facebook where. Uh, we used to have a pretty easy time advertising our stuff, but no longer can you easily mm. talk on Facebook about solutions. They just don't make it. They they don't make it easy to um, to get uh, people to notice you. Not in, right. not in my world. Not in the uh, no. alternative health. They don't, they don't want people to know what you know. Yeah, really that's sad. because they have gone in bed with the the guys who want my message to not be not be seen yeah do no evil is gone pardon that was a, their quote their their oh do mission. no evil that was a that was a uh, motto at that google was, yeah. that was their motto and i don't think it's their motto anymore uh, yeah probably not i understand that both the uh, uh, two founders sergey and uh, whoever this other guy's name was uh, are no longer uh, involved in the uh, in the running of the company. No, I don't know. I, I don't know that. I don't pay any. Yeah, I don't pay any attention to that. Uh, yeah, don't know. Page, I think, is the other one. I don't know. They they made some other company that owned that took over the company, and I just like yeah. outside of our focus. Okay. That's right. <laughs> well, good. So this is a long chat. I don't know if we're going to manage to uh, do it all in one piece or if we need to chop it up into two. We might. You might want to do part one, part two. Yeah, part part two, all about uh, running a remote business and using the modern technology from any place on the planet. Right. Yeah, I'm managing my business from Mombasa and uh, I'm talking to you wherever you may be. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and I had a problem because a lot of places, the Wi-Fi was not great. And, um, and you know, we used to record like on Skype. And if, and if my Wi-Fi was bad, the recording was bad. But I use a system called StreamYard, StreamYard.com now. And it, and it records to their servers wherever their servers are. And that has nothing to do with me anymore. Although I, man I can produce it and everything else. So, um, now I can, I can do the recordings and if my Wi-Fi is bad, I don't care, right? I just have them all set up properly and, and, then, uh, and then it records and the recording is great. So that was my big, big problem that I had to 
that I had to solve. And now that it's solved, it means I, I can go a lot of places that are maybe iffy as opposed to uh, having to always be someplace that had super good Wi-Fi, which is, which is mm -hmm. exciting. And a lot of places are really improving like uh, Medellin. Yeah. So, and so Eastern Europe is like, makes Canada look like it's in the dark ages, but. Oh, Scott, I remember it was um, six years ago, six years ago, I went traveling into Czech Republic and uh, I arrived and I was able to, for $100 to rent a hotspot. Wow. Which was four megabit bandwidth and uh, it was fully portable it was anywhere any location it was not it was uh, wireless right like it was a right. cell phone based hotspot right. that i could take any place in the entire country nice well 100 bucks right? can't beat that no no it was it was just crazy then it it felt like uh, what they have all this? Yeah, yeah. Which is a re great reason for traveling because then you start seeing how other people do things and uh, opp you know, opportunities, but also where things can be improved as opposed to just thinking, well, this is the way it is and I need to put up with it. And it's not just Wi Fi, it's different types of foods. And, and speaking of Wi Fi, I. Uh... I'm looking at it over there. Um, with the rising uh, saturation of the Wi-Fi all around us, especially with the 5G rollout, we are seeing a lot of people getting flooded with the uh, response. It's called a voltage-gated calcium channel. It's, it's a cellular response where the body itself is flooding your cells with a stress response that's triggered by the wi-fi that you're mm. inside of it's as if you were oh, wow. it's as if you were dipped into a toxic aquarium yeah and so i have i've had a client for example say say to me when i drive into the downtown area where the smart grid is i'm instantly in a panic attack wow like it so people just, are starting to feel it now oh yeah the more sensitive, you know, the canary and the coal mine, so to speak, yes. they are they are feeling it earlier than some others. But anyway, so that that thing is uh, becoming an issue. So I've teamed up with a guy, uh, a distributor of this technology called Blue Shield, and uh, so I take that with me wherever I go now. And that thing is uh, protective of my. Physical health. That's that little white thing that's almost a credit card. Yeah, you so have that. You bought it. I got that. Yeah, I got that. I really like it. It's actually down. Well, I'm you have like, it somewhere. I have it somewhere. I have it somewhere. Um, okay. Well, I think we're, we're good what for you? another year. Okay. Thank you, my good people. This is Martin Pitella and Scott Patton for Life Enthusiast. We are restoring vitality to you and to the planet. We are at www.life-enthusiast.com and I am also available by phone at 866-543-3388. Scott, thank you so much for giving us your time and uh, peace be with you. <laughs> And also with you. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, everybody, for watching. And we'll see you next year.